Hello, my name is Karen Helene Rudman. I'm the curator at the Art Center Highland Park, and I am thrilled to be introducing our audience to Ruth Ellen Weisberg. This is a privilege for me um, and an honor to be introducing you to our community here in Chicago. So welcome. I am delighted to be back in Chicago in any possible way. <laughs> so that leads me to say to, to, um, to our audience here that Ruth did grow up in Chicago. This is a homecoming of sorts. And a lot of you may not know her name, but you are really going to want to know her work. Um, she has broken through the glass ceilings that many of us have followed behind. Um, and so this really is an honor. And I would love to hear from you about what it was like going from Chicago to Ann Arbor to Los Angeles and forging your way as an artist. And so if, if you wanna talk about your story a little bit, your background, that would be great. I, I would be delighted. I feel like I was gifted the most wonderful childhood. Um, a lot, you know, a lot caused by um, my wonderful parents, Teresa and Al Weisberg. And my dad was a Chicago architect, which is an important part of the story because um, he loved Chicago and loved the history of the architecture and took my sister and I on tours of the city. My sister became an architect, which was extremely, my older sister, uh, unusual in that generation for a woman to be an architect. I mean, it was a really aesthetically and artistically inspiring childhood. I went to the Art Institute every Saturday morning for classes growing up. Um, had Emmanuel Jacobson, who's a brilliant teacher, and a number of very well-known artists like Judy Chicago and myself were his students. And um, I was blessed with a really, a great city and a great education. I went to Senn High School. Mm -hmm. That also uh, was a very <laughs> interesting, intense experience. And um, I love returning because Chicago is full of wonderful memories. And um, really for me, it's a, it's a city of art, art, architecture, the symphony, the ballet, but you know, the Art Institute was like the, the linchpin. So how did you decide to go to University of Michigan? Well, my sister had gone before me. And when I was in high school, the two prestigious places to go, um, if you were Jewish, um, because so many other places had quotas and were kind of closed, but not that uh, Michigan and Wisconsin didn't have quotas, um, they did, but you know, most people went to the University of Illinois. And so the more unusual and exciting choices were Wisconsin and Michigan. And I went to Michigan following in my sister's footsteps and I uh, had a wonderful first year and decided in that first summer um, to go to Europe. I had the possibility of doing that. And my parents were very- that was unusual for that time too. Very. Especially for a young woman to go to Europe and... It's true. Um, and uh, I went to Perugia because they had a uh, Italian language, you know, very famous Italian language school for foreigners. And um, I fell in love with Italy and uh, I stayed for three years. So. Oh, wow. So that was an amazing, life-changing experience. Spent quite a bit of time in Paris as well, where I had relatives, um, but mostly in Perugia, in Italia. Um, ho imparato di parlare in italiano molto bene. So, uh, you know, I became extremely fluent. In fact, it got to be a little difficult to speak English after three years. Amazing. And I, I got my fine arts degree. Um, with you know some shift of emphasis because it was Italy, it was probably more figurative um, than the United States would have been at that time. Which, you know, I was so inspired by art history 
which has remained, you know, a touchstone in my work, as uh, you probably noticed. <laughs> and then I returned to Michigan. I finished my bachelor's in a semester, and I started a graduate program, but not an MFA, because Professor Larson told that the, there was two of us who, women who were interested in graduate school. And he said, well, you know, we'd never get a job teaching and we would just get married. It would be wasted on us. The sexism was just rampant. And, um, you know, we, he recommended that I get a MA, which I did. But then because I was eager, you know, to learn more, I went off to France um, for a, a year and uh, worked at the Atelier 17, which was very famous, you know, Atelier 17 with William Stanley Hayter. And that was an amazing experience. Met a lot of international artists uh, from all over the world, you know, from Japan, from Norway, from Morocco, <laughs> but not from France. The French artists had their own printmaking ateliers. So that was- Were you doing printmaking from the very start as your medium? Um, I was from that, um, from being in Italy, yes. I was able, um, typically at Michigan, you couldn't start printmaking until you were a junior. I of course started as a sophomore and I had a wonderful, wonderful teacher, Padre Diego Donati who was a Francescan monk. And um, I was really his favorite, frankly. <laughs> uh, but so why, like, how did you connect? So what, why do you think you connected so much to printmaking? A very Maybe good the architecture, the work on paper or something about that. Uh, it's, you know, printmaking is very tactile. There's an element always of transformation and discovery, and it really appealed to me. Um, I had already been doing drawing and painting of all sorts all through my, you know, teenage years and even earlier, and printmaking was new and um, just transformational. It, it, it has remained with me as a passion. You know, I still do quite a bit of printmaking, and for some of the same reasons. You know, you draw and you draw and you get things on the plate and then you run it through the press, you pull off that paper and there's always an element of transformation and surprise, always. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I taught it for many years also at USC. I taught printmaking. Especially right, so that yeah. was my next question. So as an artist, you, well, let's back up for a second. So you moved to Los Angeles and you know, you're getting these shows alongside Judy Chicago, like you mentioned, and which is a big deal. And and then you become an educator at USC. So those two were a little more complex than that because I arrived in Los Angeles in 1970 when women were not getting faculty positions. And I was on the UCLA campus because I had a Ford Foundation grant. So that was my kind of okay identity my ticket yeah, that's what I was wondering how did you get that foot in the door yeah so yeah that was my foot in the door but the door was kind of gently shoved on my foot by the then faculty at UCLA which was 100% male didn't you know I I asked them to put me on their mailing list invite me to things not one yeah. invitation I mean later I had friends on the faculty but um, they at the time were 100% men and, you know, I was invisible, even though I had introduced myself and even though I was already in some museum collections like the Detroit Institute of Art and the Chicago Art Institute, I was, I was invisible, trust me, <laughs> they did not see me and they did not well, invite me. That is amazing, like how did, how did you get your work, like for people who are watching, who are, you know, struggling to get their work into institutions like that, how, how do you go about that? I mean, that's pretty amazing that you were able to have that kind of CV even going into yes. Um, yes. what you were doing. So I, 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 
I was gifted with some curators, um, encounters with curators who really saw the work and uh, admired it and wanted to acquire pieces. And it, it really made a huge difference. Um, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, sometimes it's that one person who believes in you can can change your life, right, and, and make a difference. And so, um, you know, I I had some real breaks. I also had some real discrimination. You know, it was a combination of things. Uh, women artists were really discriminated against. Uh, you know, the early '70s, we fought to be seen, recognized. We had some allies. But we also had some people who could have cared less. Um, I mean, it was it, it was a fascinating era, and we overcame, you know, decades of prejudice. But of course, there were always artists that kind of broke through. There was the Louise Nevelson mm -hmm. and the Isabel Bishop, but you know, they had a tougher time than you might mm -hmm. realize at a distance. They were oh, for sure, for sure. I think and still continue to be the, the percentages are still not where they should be, unfortunately. And and Los Angeles was interesting at that time. I moved to Los Angeles in 87 and was <laughs> supposed to work in an art gallery and they ended up not hiring me because they told me I might date their clients. And that was my first kind of slap in the face of sexism and, you know, it was, it, you know, for this generation right now in school, it's hard to imagine, but then with everything going on in the world, it's not so hard to see. So yes. it's, I think right now your work, um, it harkens back to a, a time, but it's so relevant today. So I think that's part of um, my excitement to have your work up because you have a way of merging. So let's talk about the content now of your work. You have a way of merging you know, the historical kind of story and narrative of what's happened in the past, but you place people in it from the future. And so that really is an important statement about how we're all connected through generation. And how we're connected, right, through time. Time and memory are really my touchstones, you know, mm -hmm. in other words, the idea that we can transcend time through art, you know, we can go into the museum and, and communicate with uh, Titian, you know, we can feel connected to people from the remote past, mm -hmm. we can understand them, uh, or we have flashes of understanding in any case. And art is, um, art is a time machine. And um, I embrace that. And I really feel like I'm in a dialogue with the past, um, some artists more than others. Um, and it's been a profound source of nourishment for me, profound. And I've lived in it, you know, I've lived among the Etruscan ruins, as it were, and the Roman um, artifacts and sculptures and, and then coming into, you know, uh, the Renaissance, particularly, and the Baroque. I mean, what a what a rich uh, way to connect with human beings over the course of time. Yeah. And then I read about your Jewish connection. Can you speak to that a little bit? I think that's well. I think it has a lot of the same sources. Judaism is a religion that really emphasizes the past and um, feeling at one with the past. You know, you're not remote from your history. You you get to relive it. it. It should be alive for you. And uh, so it's the same message in a way. Um, sometimes the content is a little different, but the message is the same uh, in, in its profundity and in its attitude towards time. And so I had- Humanity, you know, it does reflect humanity over and over again. And so um, I love that about your work is that it's, it, you feel it more than you just see it. You, you kind of enter this world and, and it's really beautiful and intimate in a way. I, I 
very, very pleased by your description because mm -hmm. these are the things I really seek. You know, I, I'm not after some remote formalist, you know, correct vision. I'm passionately engaged in what I do. Um, that doesn't mean the aesthetics don't matter. To the contrary, you want the aesthetics to be as strong as possible because they're your tool, they're your mode of connecting. And uh, also they're so profoundly interesting in and of themselves. Yeah, but, so I have one more question. Um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, just for a purpose. It isn't, yeah. the, the, there's, you know, this is not decoration. This is really connecting. The water dancer images that are going to be up at the art center. Yes. And it's funny that you're wearing blue because it just like, it's so blue. Um, will you just speak to those really quickly before we run out of time? I'm just so curious why the water and water dancer has so many connotations. And Almost all of my work is you're seeing through a veil of some kind, a veil of texture. The figures are, are caught in um, um, a visual representation of time and memory. So they're not crisp and absolutely in the present. They're not. And how do you communicate this through texture and washes and, and color? So the, these are a very good example because I really pushed to the limit the idea of kind of seeing through another medium, in this case, water. But mm. they're not dressed in bathing suits. They're dressed in street clothes. So we're seeing them, we're glimpsing them in a reality that is, at least makes some reference to, the nor to normal life, but it isn't. You know, we're seeing them through a, the veil of time and memory. I love that. I love that. So the exhibit is opening next month. We are so thrilled to have you here um, just for the business end of it. It opens September 30th, 5.30 to 8. And Ruth is going to give an artist talk on the first, the next day on Saturday from two to four, from, yeah, from two at two o'clock. So we are thrilled to be having you. We can't wait. I can't wait personally to, to be able to lay out the exhibit and to see it in person. So thank you so much. It, it is so much my pleasure. And I would really looking forward to sharing this with old and new friends in Chicago. <music>